Welcome to the Transformative Principle. I am your host, Jethro Jones. You can find me on Twitter at Jethro Jones. And I want to take a minute and just invite you to look at the possibility of coming up to Alaska and teaching or leading in a school or district up here. If you want to connect with me and figure out how you can make the transition up here, I'd be happy to talk to you. Right now, my superintendent position is open, so somebody who wants to make a change and make a real impact to the people of Kodiak, come on up and check that out. And there's always other opportunities. So please take a minute and connect with me and let's figure out how to get some great educators up here in Alaska. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I am excited to have you on today listening to the podcast. Really excited to talk to Don Wetrick, who's just an awesome guy. For some reason, I thought he was a principal and he wasn't. So I'm going to make a little mistake there and I apologize for that, but he's pretty chill. So thankfully he seemed okay with it and hopefully he truly was. We're going to talk about innovation and man, this is what makes me excited about education is this kind of stuff. So I hope, uh, hope you enjoy it. I hope you learn it and uh, apply something in your life as soon as possible because this is good stuff here. And thank you for listening to the podcast. It means a lot to me. Please take a minute and share this with someone who is innovative or needs to be innovative. That would be a great thing to do. Just go ahead and hit the share button right now. Text it to somebody, email it to somebody, share it on social media. That would be wonderful. Thanks so much. All right. Welcome to Transformative Principle. I'm very excited to have Don Wetrick here with me. And Don is a principal in Noblesville, Indiana, and an all-around swell guy. You might remember him from the Transformative Leadership Summit earlier this year or last year, maybe. And Don, thanks so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you. I I just got an upgrade. I'm not a principal. Oh, I'm in my own department. I'm I'm the innovation and open source learning teacher. And uh, oh. sorry about that. Yeah, no. Do you want to kick me off now or are we good? Well, you know, I I guess we'll keep recording since we're already here, but (laughs) tell me about that change because I did not know that that was was a change that happened. Oh, no, it's never been a change. I've I've never been a principal and quite frankly have not wanted to be, Um, not disrespecting the position. I just, I've always wanted (laughs) to, to teach this innovation class. I've was a broadcasting teacher, an English teacher, and then kind of, I don't want to say dumb lucked my way, but I, I kind of found my way into this um, class that we created on our own, the innovation and open source learning class. Oh, well, that is pretty awesome. I can totally get behind that. And if people who aren't on the video will not notice my face getting red, which is good for <laughs> putting my foot in my mouth, not the first time, won't be the last, but anyway, we can move on. So you've started something called the Startup Innovation. Tell me a little bit about that and, and what that looks like. Yeah, it started. <laughs> so our class, which I have to give a little bit of background on that, but you know, several years ago, I decided to start this wacky class and, and giving credit where credit's due. It was uh, from Daniel Pink's TED Talk uh, six plus years ago. And he's you know kind of discussing what the Google 20% time or what they did at Atlassian and, and all these things. And I was like, well, why can't we do that at school? So I went to my principal and I asked him if we could have that kind of class, not just a 20% time. And he said, no, but I heard yes. So I just kept pressing on and um, started forming some alliances and, and actually got some help from uh, Mr. Pink and then some really great people, uh, Tina Steely at Stanford being one of, the, one of the key to the success as well. And so this class got off to a good start. So good that we started to really make waves. And I wrote a book called Pure Genius, Creating a Culture of Innovation. And um, it's one thing led to another. And then I found my way talking about it to other places. And it started taking me quite literally all over the world and Africa and Europe and places like that. And no matter where we went, we would get this reaction of why can't my son have this class? Or I wish this kind of class was at my daughter's school, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, it, the idea was born actually from also a, a, a former student. And he said, you know, Wetrick, you know, your, your business model is pretty 1990s. You know, you, you go to a, conference, you go to a school and you're spreading the message in location based ways and, you know, do the quintessential, you know, 45 minute talk and, you know, you get everybody all riled up and then you leave. And, um, he's like, why don't we digitize some of this content and we can deliver it to more places than just, you know, one school. 
<laughs> and it's so fun to be, you know, the student has become the master kind of thing. So that was Hunter. And uh, and so he's like, you know, I'll help. And because, you know, he has taken so much from the class and, and he's you know, working with two startups right now and he's just exploding with awesomeness. So it, that's kind of where it started. So we started listening to the people that had already been to some of the conferences and we're like, okay, what's step one? What do you need? And it's funny because no matter what we do, when I talk about the, the origins of a 20% time or, or an innovation class in middle school or high school, so no matter what we'd come across, all the teachers would you know, give us feedback of, you know, hey, it sounds like the teachers need a 20% time of their own. It looks like we kind of need our own education in how to think more like an entrepreneur or a startup guy. And so like, okay. So instead of immediately going out and doing a class of here's how you do an innovation class or here's how you do a, you know, genius hour, we wanted to say, okay, here's how you start to think like a startup entrepreneur because their skill set of, you know, trial and error, failure, embracing it, and all these other buzzy words that we hear in pivots and everything else, we, we thought that there was a lot to be gleaned from that. So our first course we put up was the Start It Up mindset course, really for teachers to, to start into this. And then since then, we haven't made them public yet, but we've also done a um, course for how to do an innovation course and then how to do a 20% time elementary kind of setting. And then most, I'm really excited for this one, also the Young Entrepreneur class where it's taught by some young entrepreneurs and myself on how to be entrepreneurial and not just a case study in widgets uh, that we talk about, some of the modern exponential entrepreneurs and what they're doing digitally and things like that. So it's a whole heap of resources and information and and we're super excited about it yeah well i i love the idea and love the approach of of thinking like an entrepreneur or thinking like somebody that is not typical for us so one of the th struggles that i've seen in trying to implement this at my school with my students is kids don't trust that we are serious about this so they don't believe that we can that they can really chart their own destiny. How do you deal with that? And what is your response to that? I think that, and I'm not saying this because I love kids. I love my job. I don't think this is a scapegoat for students. I think this is a scapegoat for a lot of people. A lot of people also like convenient excuses. You know, we, we, <laughs> we like to complain about things, but when we have a chance to change it, very few people do. And I think that's the hard part and the misconception of this kind of class is that, you know, I talk to people that are all over the country. They're doing Genius Tower. And the number one complaint is, uh, what do I do? No, no, this was supposed to be a time where you were, you know, really passionate about things on what you want to work on. I don't know what I'm passionate about. No, no, what do you want to, just tell me what to do. G give me an opportunity to get an A. Well, you just told me that school wasn't engaging and you weren't having fun. Yeah, yeah, but finding my own opportunities is tough. I would rather just complain about how unengaged I am and not uh, have to worry about the hard part. Um, we jokingly call this class the January 15th to the New Year's resolution. It is fun to talk about what you're going to do. It is fun to say, man, now that I'm in the innovation class, I get to do this or I get to work on that. And that thing is hard. Sitting down and writing an essay, while might not be enjoyable to some, it may be to others, uh, that's easier. Being told what to think, man, that's, that's simple. Thinking for yourself and taking action, that's, that's tough. That's real tough. And I think that it's really imperative that we provide opportunities for our students to be innovative. But first things first, you've got to prepare their mind. And I think the hardest thing in the world is to get high schoolers to do this. This is simple at the elementary level. They're used to this. Yeah. You know, if we, if we get to them early and we don't beat the creativity out of them, then it's, <laughs> it, it's possible for them. By the time you get in middle school, they've learned how to play the game, uh, you know, of, hey, look, I sit down, I'm really quiet, I'm a good boy, you tell me what to do, I'll repeat it back to you, and I'll memorize it just as long as I need to take the test, and then when the test is over, then I'm done. Uh, that was an agreement we had with each other, and now all of a sudden a class like this rolls along, it's like, no, 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 what are you going to do? What do you mean you're going to do? You're the worker, you're the teacher, you give me something to do. It's tough. 
really, really tough for the for them to prepare their mind like that. But it's absolutely necessary because our economy now demands that we do this. Yeah. There are no jobs in tell me what you know. No one cares what you know. Information is free. Yeah. What can you do? What can you do with it? That's the only thing that really matters. And I'm happy that we're providing uh, an opportunity here at our at Noblesville High School to, to have such a course. But I'm also not going to put on airs. It's not for everybody. I'll still get some students that struggle mightily by getting out of their own matrix, right? So they're like, they still, they, they at first thought it would be fun to do these things on their own, but they're, and, and I hate to say this, a lot of times they're, they're the good GPA kids. The kids with a lower GPA seem to run with this and not care about the grade. But, you know, we'll see how it plays out. This is my six and a half year providing this class. So, so how do you prepare their minds for it? Like, what are some, some things that you do and by extension that principals can do to prepare their teachers' minds for it? Uh, so that's actually what the, that's actually some of the resources we're providing and putting out. We have different methodologies. You know, we do a collect and connect. We understand the Roth IRA and that's an acronym other than a great tax advantage savings vehicle. There's little tips, there's tricks. You know, if you look around my room, there's books that, that I adore and rarely are they educational. I actually have my own podcast and, and about to, actually it's about to release. So maybe when this airs, but uh, the podcast is in um, lunches in January, 2017. And it's basically interviewing startup people and entrepreneurs. And we glean from books, you know, from Daniel Pink, from Peter Thiel, from Simon Sinek, uh, Seth Godin, people like that. Cause those are the people that are honestly talking about the careers of the future and so, you know, we expose them to that. We deliberately take social media very seriously, very seriously, which I'm actually starting to have some misgivings on that. I'll tell you why later. But, you know, we have our own day where we, you know, we curate a great social media profile. We, you know, make sure we're on LinkedIn. We tweet at people that we would die to collaborate with. And, um, and, and that's about seven to eight weeks of the course. And then, quite frankly, it's a year course. And then, quite frankly, the rest of the year, they're working on projects of their choice and they're deciding what those projects are and they're deciding what it is that every aspect of that right and you're the guide on the side not the sage on the stage yeah well and then i'm also judge and executioner at times right. too. i mean so when that, yeah case in point yeah they have to write a proposal and and then they have to identify the standard they're going to knock out and, and again all this is available on, on startupinnovation.com but I, i'm also I'll push back because sometimes it's, you know, I, I, I fill their heads with the idea that they're, you know, they're powerful and they can collaborate, but then they'll say, Hey, I'm going to collaborate with Andrew Luck. No, you're not. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to get a hold of uh, Michael Jordan, LeBron James. No, you're not. I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you 48 hours, but in the meantime, try to collaborate with people that are realistic. So like case in point, one of my students said, Hey, I really, really want to talk to Elon Musk about uh, electric vehicles. I'm like, <laughs> good luck with that. And so, you know, they started digging around. They figured out who the chief electrical engineer was, and he got back to them. So those are the kind of things that um, that while, you know, because some people, like, give me a weird look when I say, well, they can work on whatever they want to work on. Well, we're not, you know, selling drugs and alcohol and shooting pornography or anything crazy like that. So it's within means, but it's also realistic, too, on how to, you know, start small and kind of build up and find those awesome collaborators. And, and, and honestly, I think that's where a lot of the success lies. Even with like, you know, last year we had three or four patents filed and only reason why we did is because we had the financial backing of a lawyer who said, yeah, I'll waive my fees. That stuff is crazy. Awesome. But these things wouldn't have happened if we wouldn't have harnessed social media. Yeah. And so what is it that you're focusing on creating things or are you really letting the kids do whatever they want? Like if a kid's really into history, they're not yeah. probably going to create, you know, something a new invention, they might create something to help them understand history better, but well, it, no, yes and no. I try. This is one of our, our hard parts is that everything that you do has to, oh, we have a rule of thirds and not the photography rule of thirds. Every project that you submit has to be one third personal interest. Simple. That's why you chose it. One third skill or technical acquisition. Okay. It's kind of going along the lines of personal interest. And so how are you going to use those skills? Okay. Last one third is the hardest. How is it going to impact others? Because I want people to know that sustainability is had easily when you're helping others. And some of the greatest things that have come out in the last 20th century had nothing to do with just 
to be for benefit one person, right? So if a kid says this happened not too long ago, uh, yeah, I want to I want to learn the stock market so I can make money. Okay, it's like all right. Tell me on your one third personal interest. Well, I like money. All right, skills acquisition, techniques and tricks of you know great day traders and you know options and futures and things like that. I'm like, okay, how's this going to benefit others? Well, I mean, I I want money. <laughs> so I was like, so I forced him to reframe that, and he's like, you know what? Maybe I could work with a lot of kids, you know, at the middle school or grade school and teach them how basic savings and why investing in the stock market with like dividends and and you know low risk you know, drip accounts and things like that, how that would be good that by the time they were like, you know, 30, they would have X amount of dollars. And I go, okay, now you're onto something. So yeah, you know, a student like that isn't necessarily, you know, producing a product, but they are producing something that can benefit others. But that's also why this class we call it innovation, the open source learning, the open sources we're connecting with others. I, I can't tell you how great that is. I hate it when people say, well, it's not what you know, it's who you know, and they bemoan that. Well, hey, no people get out there, man. And I think, you know, if teachers are listening to this and principals, especially, we know everybody, right? We're celebrities in our own town because we, we've, if you've taught long enough, you know, everybody in town. So, you know, put that to use. So when, when we kind of scale up, that's also why this innovation class really becomes an entrepreneurial class, no matter what you've done. an innovation is an idea, an entrepreneur brings that idea to life and they, you know, push it out to the world. And that's that's what I'm interested in. Um, I hate it when people say, well, I'm trying to create really great employees of the future. I'm trying to create employers. I mean, I don't want to sound like a braggadocious. I don't want my kids to be working for somebody else. I want them to be that guy. I want them to empower people. And, and um, yeah, so anyway. And be in control of their own destiny, right? That Yeah. I- that is yes. what the real power is, is that if you even if you become a teacher or a principal or someone in education, you still are relying on somebody else to make ends meet for you and do the things that you need to do. What I want is for our students to be in control. And if they choose to work for somebody or they choose to be an employee, that's one thing. But I want them to have the skills and power to be able to be the one to choose that, not be forced into it. But see, where do you find that in education? This is what drives me absolutely insane. So we, we've got right now this high risk, low reward thing of a grade and then beholden to whether a college accepts you or not. And I'm, I'm a little bit perturbed. Why, there's several universities that claim to be so innovative, but they go after the GPA chasers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, okay, this kid has a 4.4 GPA. Okay, what did he do? Well, he served on prom committee. Well, good for him. What risks did he take? Did he start a business? Did he start a movement? Did he have an organization that he ran? I mean, there's a lot of kids out there that are really, really intelligent, but they have a 2.0. Why? Because they're experimenting. They're doing other things. And I think that when you start talking about, I want them to be in control of their own destiny, we have conditioned so many kids to never take a risk. Because that could end up in a B, and if I get a B, I can't go to, you know, fill in your favorite college. So I've got a bone to pick with a lot of university <laughs> policies and, of admittance and things like that. But um, but there's, there's changing. I mean, there, there's, there's some things going on. I remember there was almost a year ago when they said, hey, we're going to stop putting so much emphasis on the SAT. Well, good for you. Thank you. Yeah, it's about time. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and even Google, like, changed their policy of instead of constantly – awarding their jobs to the who's who of the Ivy League schools, they're like, you know, there's a lot of really creative coding software developing skateboard kids out there who are running circles around Ivy League guy, right, or Ivy League girl. So they're even starting to do a second take of people that can do versus people that can sit and subserviently and tell you what you want to hear. Yeah. And in, in education, it's difficult for us to do that because we are so focused on compliance and not risk or risk taking. So great interview with Don there. And that was just the first half. We're going to talk a little bit more next time about how to make the standards real, where to begin, and some of the negatives that come with doing this innovation stuff. So thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And I hope that you uh, are able to apply some of these things to your school right now. 
Transformative Principal is a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators by educators. Visit edupodcastnetwork.com for more great podcasts.